Hello and welcome to Coronavirus Q&A. Tonight and every Monday night, we're going to try to answer as many of your questions as possible about the COVID-19 pandemic. From the government, we'll be joined by the Foreign Secretary, Dominic Raab. Dr. Sarah Jarvis will be dealing with your health concerns. For all your questions about shopping, work and staying at home, Chris Choi will join me. And Tom Daly gives us his top tips for living in lockdown. Over the next half an hour, you can get in touch with us. You can email your questions to coronavirus at itv.com or find us on the ITV News Facebook page. If you're on Twitter or Instagram, just use the hashtag coronavirusqa. All that to come. But first, here's what you need to know tonight. The government has announced it'll rescue tens of thousands of tourists still stranded abroad. We've designated £75 million to support those flights and the airlines in order to keep the cost down and affordable for those seeking to return to the UK. That's as 180 more deaths were confirmed in the UK. We got our first official look inside Britain's new field hospital, which will care for thousands of coronavirus patients. And on Friday, he ran out of Downing Street. Today, the Prime Minister's top advisor, Dominic Cummings, is self-isolating after showing symptoms. Our aim tonight and on every programme is to put your questions to those making the decisions about your health and your life right now. My first guest is the Foreign Secretary, Dominic Raab. Um, our first question, Dominic Raab, for you is from Lisa. She asks, how much longer are we going to take to catch up with Italy and shut down all non-essential work? Well, the critical thing and all the advice, scientific medical advice that we've had is that the most important thing is to take the right measures at the right time. So the advice we've got is that what will really make a difference right now is not expanding the restrictions we've already got in place, but just making sure that everyone is following the letter and the spirit of those guidance. The more that happens, the more effectively we protect our NHS and save lives. So no change at the moment on that one. Lots of questions coming into us about personal protective equipment. Laban wants to know why are paramedics not being prioritised when it comes to PPE? Well, we are prioritising the uh, frontline NHS staff and in order to expand that as rapidly as possible, we're tapping all the potential uh, sources of supply in the UK, but also in as Foreign Secretary, we're making sure that through all of our embassies abroad, we've got as many of the uh, international supply chains and sources of supply of PPE equipment coming into the UK, precisely so we can roll it out uh, within the NHS and also be important in the social care system as rapidly as we physically can. But no special treatment specifically for paramedics at the moment? Well, we're prioritising it and we take advice from the NHS about where it should go um, uh, and in what, uh, in what order of priority. But obviously they're really important and that's why we're uh, straining every sinew to get those supplies both domestically and internationally on, into the NHS so that they can be rolled out more broadly. All right, one here from a supermarket worker, Adrienne. She asks, after NHS staff are tested, we know that's starting now, do we think this would eventually stretch to testing other key workers who are at risk? Well, as was updated uh, first thing this morning, we'd had uh, 400 of those tests done uh, for frontline staff within the NHS. And again, as with PPE equipment, we're trying to get as many of those tests supplied uh, through domestic sources, international sources as possible, and then we will roll it out uh, as broadly as we can. And of course, I think it's absolutely right to note not just the uh, incredibly important work that those on the front line in the NHS, on the, in the police, uh, but also those in vital supply chains. So people working in the supermarkets, people doing the jobs to keep uh, food coming into the supermarkets and into our homes, the vital role they play. So yes, they do matter. They're incredibly important too. So they may get tested in the future by the sounds of it. David wants to know, why haven't we closed our borders and tested all arrivals like many other countries when we see people flying back into the UK? 
there's been a dramatic reduction in flights uh, globally, but the medical advice we've had is that this would make no significant difference to the uh, challenge of uh, stopping and reducing the spread of coronavirus. And of course, so if we, of course, if we uh, barred entry into ports and airports, it would hamper our ability to get the hundreds of thousands of British nationals abroad home safe and sound. One of the things we've done today is announce a package of measures working with the airlines to make sure that we can reach potentially stranded and vulnerable British nationals abroad. So we're doing the right thing by the science, but also making sure that we can get UK nationals home. OK, a final one for you from Cathy. Why is Britain not spraying public areas with disinfectants like they're doing in China and South Korea? Principally because all of the measures we're taking have been guided by the medical advice, the scientific advice we've got, and they reflect that, that advice. What matters now above all else is that the guidelines, the letter and the spirit of the guidelines about staying home with subject to the limited exceptions are followed. The more people, your viewers included, follow that guidance, the quicker we get through this challenge and get through it uh, with uh, as few lives lost as possible. All right, Dominic Raab, thank you for joining us tonight. Thank you. Time now to get your health questions to one woman who usually has all the answers. Dr. Sarah Jarvis joins me. Uh, look, lots of people have got in touch with us uh, to ask the same question about who can you self-isolate with. Let's hear first from Jennifer. If my household self-isolates for two weeks and also my mum who lives alone self-isolates for two weeks, is it then safe for her to come and stay with us for childcare to allow my husband and I to work from home? Sarah, we're all getting used to the new rules, aren't we? Can you help Jennifer? I can, and it slightly depends, however, on whether her mum is healthy and how old her mum is. So if her mum is over 65, certainly if she's over 70, I really wouldn't recommend that she be in a household with children if the children are ever going to leave the house and if anybody is going to leave the house. Because while we've heard of those very high-risk people being shielded, in other words, staying at home completely, really anybody who's at risk, and that's anybody eligible for an NHS flu vaccine, really should be trying to stay as far away from other people as possible. If, however, she's under 65 and in otherwise good, good health, if all of you keep yourself safe for two weeks, you should be absolutely fine to get together. But no moving backwards and forwards. The more people move, the greater the risk. And once she's there, she stays there. And ideally, you all stay inside and away from other people. Choose your house. OK, next question comes in from Rita. If you've had a, a pneumonia jab, does that give you any immunity, any protection, or does it not make any difference at all to this virus? Sarah, we know that lots of people over 70 have had that jab. What's the answer? So, Rita, it's not going to protect you against coronavirus infection, against COVID-19. However, some people who become severely ill with coronavirus get inflammation of the lungs. It's called pneumonitis, so tonsillitis, appendicitis, inflammation, but this time of the lungs. And in that case, you can be vulnerable to another infection getting in while your lungs are inflamed. So it won't protect you against coronavirus, but it could, if you became seriously ill, reduce the chance of you getting another infection, which could make you even sicker. All right, an answer for Rita there. One from one of our younger viewers now. This is Madeline. How fast can the coronavirus spread through touch? So say if I cough with my hand and I handshake someone, how fast will the germ spread? How fast, Sarah? Well, Madeline, that is a fantastic question. You are clearly a highly intelligent young woman, and therefore I'm quite sure you would never cough on your hand. You would either cough into a tissue or into the crook of your arm, and then once you'd disposed of the tissue, you'd wash your hands. But the answer to your actual question is that if somebody did cough onto their hand and then touch someone else or shake their hands, it can transfer straight away. And in fact, the sooner somebody else touches either your hand or a hard surface, if you've coughed onto something and the droplets have sprayed onto there, the greater the risk because the more viruses are alive. OK, thank you for that. It's Francesca's turn next. She has a question that lots of people are concerned about the future, really. Let's have a listen. My mum is seriously ill in hospital with the coronavirus. When she's recovered, will it have caused permanent damage to her body? What do we know about what might happen next, Sarah? Well, Francesca, I'm really sorry to hear that your mum is ill. Unfortunately, 
The good news is that hopefully she will get better. We've got great medical services out there. Unfortunately, however, if you have severe coronavirus, it can lead to inflammation of the lungs, which can lead to long-term scarring. And that could mean problems in the long term with her breathing. People who become very, very ill with coronavirus can end up with sepsis, which is the body's overwhelming response to infection that can damage all parts of the body, including the kidneys, the lungs, the brain even, and the heart. But particularly for people who are seriously rather than critically unwell, it's the lungs which are like to be, likely to be affected long term. The next question comes from Yasmin, who's written to us. She says, I am the mother of a two-week-old baby. What do we know about the impact of the virus on newborns? Lots of people will be uh, thinking about this, I'm sure. So until actually just a couple of days ago, what we said was there was no evidence that a mum who had coronavirus during pregnancy could pass it on to her baby. There's been one case now, and the Royal College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists have just updated their guidance to say, theoretically, it is possible for a, a mother, from the look of it, to pass it on to her baby in the womb. However, once your baby is born, obviously, breastfeeding is the best thing that you can do. If, however, you develop coronavirus shortly after you deliver, we would love you to still keep expressing, but maybe consider, firstly, not coughing on your baby, trying not to breathe on your baby, and then maybe consider, for instance, expressing your milk and getting another caregiver to give it. The good news is that even if a baby gets coronavirus, the likelihood of them being seriously unwell is absolutely minuscule. With other infectious diseases like flu, babies can be really badly affected. The good news with coronavirus is the outcome seems very good for babies and children who get it. A final question uh, from Maria. You mentioned earlier the 1.5 million people who are being shielded. She's got a specific question for you about that. I'm being advised to shield for 12 weeks as I'm in a high-risk group. My partner is now working from home as a consequence. Will they also have to be shielded? What can you tell her? Okay, that's a really good question. Sorry. Uh, theoretically, uh, if you're shielding, you should be avoiding everybody and that is for your own protection however i would say that if your partner genuinely can stay inside and shield themselves as well in other words have no contact from the outside world for at least two weeks then after that time there's no reason why you shouldn't have contact with each other together if you're shielding and somebody else in the family is having to leave the house i'm afraid we do have to recommend that you isolate yourself from them as well as from the outside world Dr. Sarah Jarvis, thank you for joining us for tonight and we hope to see you again next week. Thank you so much. We're going to take a quick break now, but uh, keep your questions coming in to us this evening. When we come back, we'll be live in Beijing to get you some expert advice on being stuck at home. And... I love knitting. It's just, I love it. I could literally do it all day. <laughs> we'll hear how Tom Daly is dealing with not being able to dive.
Welcome back to Coronavirus Q&A, where every Monday night we'll be trying to answer your questions about the pandemic. We've already had thousands. Please do keep them coming in and join the debate by using the hashtag Coronavirus QA. The ITV News consumer editor Chris Choi will be here shortly to talk shopping, work and even haircuts. But first, let's hear from someone who has already lived through a lockdown. Debbie Edward joins me now from the Chinese capital, Beijing. Debbie, we are just starting our second stay at home week. What advice have you got for people in the UK right now? Well, I think it was probably made easier for us here in China because it all happened very, very quickly after that initial lockdown in Wuhan. It was like a domino effect that city by city and province by province, the country basically shut down. But I remember at that time, this virus didn't even have a name and, and countries, including the UK, were warning their citizens to get out of China. So I think what took hold here very quickly was a fear of the virus, that it could spread quickly, that anybody could get it and anybody could spread it. So I, there wasn't any resistance to the lockdown here. So, so that really helped people stay at home. And, and for us here, of course, we were working 24-7, even sleeping here in the office during that time. But my advice for people in the UK, first and foremost, would be, although you are cut off from friends and family, keep those lines of communication open on a daily basis, because you can't underestimate what um, toll this is going to take on you mentally, this kind of restriction. And I think it's important to keep sharing and keep talking to people and actually focus on what you can do, not what you can't do. Debbie, restrictions are starting to be lifted in Wuhan where the pandemic started. What are people allowed to do now? Well, people are starting to move around a lot more. It is looking busier out on the streets here in Beijing as well. And it's, it's actually wonderful to hear children out playing again on the streets. But of course, foreigners, we can't move around yet. We are not allowed to have these green virus free codes that allow us to move around the country. But the, the, the movement is starting, but the restrictions in terms of temperature checks, in terms of social distancing, in terms of numbers allowed in restaurants and shops, that is still very much in force. And I think I think what people are coming to accept here is that that is our new norm. OK, Debbie Edward, thank you very much. Thank you. Chris, as we've been now, lots to get through. Let's start with Stephen. He says, I am classed as extremely vulnerable, but can't get a supermarket delivery slot. My food supply is getting very low. What am I meant to do? What's oh, he meant to Stephen, do? Stephen, it's just awful, isn't it, that people are actually facing the prospect of hunger going through all of this. The supermarket slots just aren't there for many vulnerable people. Instead, people are relying on friends, family, neighbours. If that happens, make sure they leave the stuff on your doorstep. Then there are charities, volunteers, details in local papers and online. The government is sending out food parcels. It's all a bit haphazard, not quite sure who's going to get them and when. 50,000 going out this week, so at least it's a start. OK, sounds like help is coming. Uh, lots of work-related questions questions, as you would imagine. Let's start with one from Dean. As a window cleaner, I work on my own and rarely make contact with customers as they pay online. Should I get back out to work? I think so. There are so many people locked indoors. It'd be quite nice to see outdoors through nice, clean windows. In circumstances like this, where you can distance at work, go ahead and do it. But, but no accidents, please, on the ladder. We are trying to relieve the NHS of these extra burdens. Yeah, stay away from A&E. Mr Spence has got in contact to say, I'm a refuse collector. Should I be wearing extra protection? It's an interesting one, particularly since we now know that the virus can live on things like packaging for up to three days. Obviously, refuse collectors wear gloves, they wash after each shift, so that's a, a great protection for them. Some councils, though, are asking us to do our bit. Um, for example, with your used tissues, put them aside in a bag, leave them 72 hours before putting them in the main bin as an extra safeguard to, to help protect these people that we used to take for granted, but certainly no more. Mm, absolutely. Uh, lots coming in about the uh, practicalities of the staying at home rules. Um, Kay says, this is a really difficult one. Can my family of four travel by car from the northeast of England to go to a family funeral 
in South Yorkshire? Well, sorry for your loss, Kay. Yes, uh, you can travel for a funeral. It is specifically catered for in these rules. But once you get to the funeral, it, it won't be familiar. Uh, it'll be very different from the norm. Uh, you'll have to sit six foot away from all the other mourners, but at least, yeah, you can be there to show your, your final condolences and respects. Goodness. Um, Richard has been in touch. What is a person in isolation supposed to do to the top-up prepayment gas and electricity meters? I think this is an important one. Um, I, I looked at some numbers on this. Typically, if you are isolated for two weeks, the average energy you'll go through is going to cost about £46. Now, some of the energy companies have made arrangements whereby if you dip into the emergency reservoir, it used to be about £5. That's been upscaled to about £45, £50. People like uh, Empower and Eon uh, have already done that. British Gas are saying give them a call and they can do something via the phone lines. But importantly, all the energy companies have done a deal with the regulator saying they will look out for vulnerable people, especially with these prepay meters. A quick question. A lot of people uh, wanting to know about holidays booked in the future. Nobody's thinking about holiday right now, of course. Yeah. Katie says, I've booked a holiday to Cyprus in September. Should I pay the next instalment? This is a really odd one because instinctively you'd think, no, don't pay any more. But if you keep up your instalments, you maintain all of your consumer rights. If you stop paying, those consumer rights disappear. And if, as is possible, that holiday gets cancelled, you wouldn't get a full refund. So strange as it may seem, the best advice is probably, yeah, to pay the next instalment. OK, uh, a quick one to finish. Uh, Michael wants to know, can you tell me, is it possible to get a simple thing like a haircut? <laughs> now the salons have closed. It isn't simple anymore. You've got to hope there's somebody in your household that's got those skills. Otherwise, get a hat. I think that might be the big new fashion icon as we go through this. I'll take your advice, Chris, for now. Thank you. Uh, before we go, we're all having to get used to staying at home, sharing tips with friends and family, perhaps learning new skills or dusting off some old ones. But what's it like if you are an Olympic diver stuck indoors? No way of getting to your nearest pool. Here's Tom Daly's life in lockdown. Hi, I'm Tom Daly, Olympic diver, and this is my lockdown with the stars. I am currently living with my husband, my son and my mum together. I'm getting to spend so much time with Robbie, my son, like that I would never have imagined I was going to in the build up to an Olympic Games. Worst thing about lockdown, I guess, not being able to go outside, but everyone's in the same boat. Making a poncho for Robbie. I love knitting. It's just, I love it. I could literally do it all day. <laughs> I get up in the morning, work out right away, because if you don't get it done first thing in the morning, it's less and less likely it's gonna happen at the end of the day. Been listening to a lot of 80s music with my mum around. She loves it. And also a little bit of reggaeton randomly when we eat burritos. Most mundane achievement was clearing out my man box of all the things that I've just chucked in and left there for years. Today, I'm just wearing a T-shirt, but at uh, one well, and <laughs> bottoms, don't worry. Um, but normally it's workout clothes because I'm working out or I'm in pajamas. I'm pretty pretty on the shower train, although I know lots of people that have not been. Let's just say that. <laughs> Thank you, Tom. Look, uh, obviously we didn't get through all of your questions tonight, but we will be back at eight o'clock next Monday. So please do keep sending them to us. And we'll be putting more questions to Chris and to Dr. Sarah Jarvis online shortly. You'll find that on our website. Thank you for watching. Bye bye.
Welcome back to Coronavirus Q&A with Chris Choi and Dr. Sarah Jarvis. There are lots more questions for you both. Um, Sarah, if I start with you, I've got a question here from Steph. Um, why does this virus appear to be leaving children largely unaffected? It's a really good question. We don't absolutely know why. What we do know is that the very small proportion of children who've been badly affected in the big study that we saw come out of China, there were three children who are critically ill and one who died, all have serious underlying problems which affect their immune system. And that makes their immune system less able to fight off infection. Now, interestingly, one of the things that happens when you get a severe infection is that you get inflammation inside your lungs. And we think that actually your immune system is doing some of of the damage. So we don't know exactly why children who don't have a great immune system are not getting severely unwell when, for instance, they're much more likely to get severe damage from, say, some forms of meningitis. But we are very grateful that that's the case. Yeah, uh, we really are. Um, Rhonda has been in touch. She says, I've been in isolation since last Friday for I had a headache, runny nose, sore throat and a bit of a temperature. I'm feeling a lot better what would what you say I should do? What would you say? I'm sorry. Um, I should do for the rest of the week. Uh, she says she lives on her own. Okay. So if you live on your own, that's really important because there's a big difference between the recommendations if you live alone or if you live with somebody else. If you live on your own and you develop either a fever above 37.8 degrees or a new cough or a different cough, if you've got a regular one, some people would say COPD or smokers will have a regular cough. But if it's a different one for you, we recommend that you isolate for at least seven days from when you feel unwell. Now, if you had a fever... Headache is not a classic symptom, but quite a lot of people get it. Diarrhea is not one of the typical symptoms, but about one in three people get it. Muscle aches and pains, feeling absolutely exhausted. All of those seem to be very, very common with coronavirus. The two which the NHS says mean you should self-isolate, a cough and fever. You've had a fever. So I would say that you look after yourself really well, that you take plenty of rest, that you must self-isolate if you have had a fever, if it was above 37.8 degrees centigrade, and that you take regular paracetamol. Now, ibuprofen is an interesting one because a lot of people, if they feel unwell, if they feel achy, if they have flu, they'll take ibuprofen. Theoretically, there is a risk with, say, chickenpox, that if you take ibuprofen, you can get a more severe skin infection. So we don't recommend it. And there have been some concerns that maybe taking ibuprofen made you more prone to more severe coronavirus. That concern came out of France. The U, the, in the UK, they've said just to be on as a precaution, probably best to avoid ibuprofen if you have coronavirus. But if you're taking anti-inflammatories of any sort, whether it's ibuprofen or naproxen, for any other reason like arthritis, carry on taking it. The World Health Organization has just come out and said, actually, there isn't any reason to avoid it. But if you can take paracetamol, use that instead. OK, thank you for that. Um, back to uh, Chris and uh, lots of questions about work. Look, we, we had two big announcements from the government about what they can pay right now, but very specific questions because the, the devil really is in the detail. Chloe has said, I'm on a zero hours contract. I'm not earning any money. What help can I get? Chloe, good news in the middle of all this is that the government have said that people on zero hours contracts and agency workers are eligible for the job retention scheme. Now, this gets us into this territory of the furlough, a bit of a fancy pants word yeah. that's just about grown up recently. It basically means that your job is put on hold and you get 80% of your salary up to £2,500 a month. What they'll do for somebody like Chloe is look back at her average monthly earnings. It's quite complicated. The scheme's only just started, but the help will be there for her. You've got to be patient with that one. Um, another one from Natalie, she's written, if someone is high risk and is advised to take 12 weeks off work, the, the 1.5 million, does the government pay for this period of time? Well, yeah, these really are the people that we're meant to be looking after most carefully of all. The first two weeks, there is statutory sick pay available, £94.25 a week. After that, it gets a little bit more interesting, a little bit more complex. 
if you're employed, you can ask your employer to put you on this furlough scheme, which gives you 80% of your earnings. That has to be agreed between the employer and the employee. If that's not possible, then you're looking at the benefit system. The government says it's opened up an expanded universal credit to make it much easier easier for people in this position. But of course, it's it's going to be pretty tricky to navigate through that. But first of all, you've got sick pay and then potentially this furlough scheme. OK, it's very difficult, isn't it? Because you've not uh, been in that situation by choice at all. Um, Dr Jarvis, Leslie has been in contact. How long is someone sick for when they have the virus? It very much depends. Some people will not get any symptoms at all. In fact, we think there may be more people who don't get symptoms than those who have it. And we're not going to know that until we start testing large swathes of the population. So basically, that if you have the virus, you've got asymptomatic, the mildest and probably the most common, then quite a lot of people will get mild symptoms. Fewer people get moderate, fewer still will get severe, and the fewest will be critically ill. Overall, about 80% of people, if they do get symptoms, will have mild or moderate symptoms, and they should be feeling better within about a week or so. If you feel better after a week and your fever's gone, even if you've still got a bit of a cough, you can stop self-isolating. If you feel unwell, you continue to self-isolate and you watch out for worsening symptoms, particularly getting very breathless. Sarah, just on the issue of symptoms, what's your take on the anecdotal evidence coming through about people uh, experiencing a, a loss of taste or smell or both? Yeah, it's actually not just anecdotal. There aren't any official studies yet, but ENT UK, which is a very major group of ear, nose and throat surgeons in the United Kingdom, have said they consider this to be such a common symptom that they believe that should be one of the criteria that makes somebody go into self-isolation. And indeed, I gave advice to somebody just today that if they have those symptoms, that really they ought to be self-isolating. And ideally, they should be putting the family into two-week self-isolation. It is worth pointing out that if you are in that position, that you can go onto the NHS website and get a, an isolation form. You don't need to contact your GP about it. Every doctor I've uh, interviewed over the past month, I've asked uh, this question, so I'll ask it to you. A new continuous cough. Can you give me a definitive answer of what that is? <laughs> Funnily enough, I asked the Deputy Chief Medical Officer this in person and she sort of rolled her eyes and said, well, the problem is it new means it's different for you or you haven't had one before. So if, for instance, a lot of people will have had a virus a few weeks ago and then when the regulations changed, they still had a little bit of a tickly cough left. If it's a tickly cough that's been there for a while and is on the way out, then that's probably fine. If, say, you are a smoker and you have a smoker's cough, if you have COPD and you cough regularly most days, then that's fine as long as it hasn't changed. So new means completely new or new for you. In other words, coughing more or coughing differently than you did. And when they talk about continuously, we're probably talking about half a day rather than just say an hour, which might happen if you had a choking fit. All right. Thank you for that. Um, a, a question I absolutely love here from Anne. She says, my elderly mum was wondering if she has to keep washing her hands for 20 seconds, um, even if she hasn't been outside at all. Wow, that's a really good question. Of course, you would think the answer would be no. But the question is, has anything in your house been outside for 20 seconds in the last 72 hours? So, for instance, we have heard a new study that came out about 10 days ago now suggested that the virus can survive on, outs on hard surfaces such as plastic or metal, apart from copper, for up to three days in fairly significant amounts and on cardboard probably for up to a day. We don't absolutely know about paper, but I would say just about the same. So my feeling is that, yes, it is probably a very good habit to get into. When this is all over, we really want kids to go back to running around and rolling around in mud pies because that's the way they get their immunity up. At the moment, we have a virus here which nobody is immune to. And therefore, I think we all need to take precautions. At the very least, wash your hands for at least 20 seconds. Don't forget the thumbs. Don't forget the fingers. Don't forget to wash the backs as well as the front. And of course, scrape through so you get the sides as well. So all bits of your hands, at least 20 seconds before you touch your face, 
before you prepare food and after you've touched anything that has been in the outside world. Okay, Sarah, thank you. Uh, on that uh, food question there, Maureen, Chris has said, I'm in the vulnerable category for a food delivery. What safety measures should we adopt when unpacking our food deliveries? Well, yeah, exactly. As Dr Jarvis has just said, there is some very new persuasive evidence that the virus can survive on packaging for up to three days. So you're going to have to be very, very careful. You're going to have to get into a bit of a procedure. The best protection from this virus is that we protect ourselves and protect others. You're going to have to take that packaging off very carefully. You're going to have to discard it very carefully. And then after that, you're going to have to wash your hands very, very carefully and get into that habit because stuff is coming in from the outside world and you have to for this period, be very much on your guard. Yeah, absolutely. Things we didn't even think about. Um, Sharon says, I am in the at-risk group but have to walk a Labrador. I'm really worried about it being passed on via pets. Yeah, well, the official, a lot of people are concerned about this. And I checked. The official government line is that pets are not a risk. And let's face it, we're in a very peculiar stage where the humans are more looking forward to their walkies now each day than the actual dogs are. The, the big danger for somebody that is vulnerable, I think, walking a dog is that dogs, particularly I would suspect Labradors, have no grasp of social distancing. They can drag you into a situation that you don't want to be in where you'll end up within that two metre perimeter of people. That's one problem. Next problem is that uh, dogs get patted by all and sundry when they're out in the park. They can then be carrying stuff back on their fur. So even more so than normally, you must wash your hands after your pet has been out like that. It's just a routine you're going to have to get into. But wash otherwise, your... you know, going out in the fresh air for exercise is going to do you and the dog good. Wash your hands, wash your hands, wash your hands. Sarah, a final one to you, please. Uh, lots of people concerned about this. Alison says, my husband has asthma. He works in a warehouse. Should he still be going to work? I think that's a very difficult one indeed. So partly it depends on how severe the asthma is. The one thing we would say is regardless of how severe your asthma is, if you're taking a steroid inhaler, as most people are, please keep taking it. It is much more important that you keep your asthma well controlled. That will protect you against severe complications much more than any immune suppression from that tiny dose of steroid would put you at risk. So that's the first thing. Secondly, if he's working in a warehouse only, and I mean only, if he can stay within away, more than six feet away from each other. So anybody who is at risk, whether it's a pregnant woman working in the NHS, whether it's a man with asthma, if you cannot keep social distancing, then your employer should either be allowing you to work from home or if they can't, should be finding you a job which allows you to keep socially distant. All right, Dr. Sarah Jarvis and Chris Choi, thank you very much for joining me this evening and thank you for watching. Good night.